Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to church today. And uh, it's nice to see you all here this morning. My name's Robin. If we haven't met before, I'll be leading our service. And a special hello to everyone joining us online as well. Um, wherever you are in your homes, we hope this is an opportunity for you to worship with us today. Uh, today we are up to week three in our series on grace as we remember all of God's goodness to us. We remember God's character and the way that he relates to us. And today we'll be thinking about the old parable of the prodigal son. And Jeff will be leading us through that a little bit later on. Today we're also going to be sharing in communion together as well. So if you are at home, you may like to prepare for yourself some juice and some bread so that you can share in communion with us. But as we start this time together, we're going to do so in prayer and Michelle is going to lead us in prayer. So Michelle, if you'd like to come up the front, Michelle will lead us in prayer as we um, begin this time of worship together today. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of being your children who can bring our prayers before you, knowing that not only do you hear us, but that your Holy Spirit helps us to pray according to your perfect will. Father, our world is in such a state of disorder and pain at this time. The COVID pandemic is overwhelming many nations with huge death tolls. Natural disasters are disrupting so many people and places. Political and financial pressures are mounting up. And as always, the poor and the vulnerable continue to suffer the most. Thank you, Father, that no matter how chaotic the world appears to be, that you are still Lord of all your creation and your good purposes will be fulfilled in your perfect timing. Help us to be faithful in prayer, watchful and obedient in completing whatever you give us to do and trusting you in every challenge that we face. We pray that you would raise up godly leaders in every country to rule with wisdom, justice and humility. Please show us peaceful ways to speak into the laws of our nation and to use our democratic rights in respectful ways. May our national and state leaders serve us and especially protect the vulnerable with sound decisions and unity of purpose in these difficult times. We pray that you would protect and encourage our fellow Christians who are suffering from persecution around the world. May they know your love and faithful provision day by day Bless and protect our link missionaries who serve you so far from home and family. May we give generously and prayerfully to support them in whatever ways we can. We lift up before you all who are suffering through sickness, grief and stresses of many kinds. We especially think of those we know personally who are going through challenging times and we silently name them before you now. May you comfort them with your love and encouragement. We pray for our young people, those who will soon be sitting their HSC, school or tertiary exams those who struggle to learn, those looking for employment or, or whose family circumstances cause them distress. May they find their hope in you and may those who bring the scriptures to them through Seket, scripture teaching or children's and youth ministries speak your words of truth and light. May every Christian ministry faithfully preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus so that many will find salvation and new life in him. We also pray for our families. Please, please protect our marriages and help us to be faithful to our marital vows 
and keep us sexually pure in the ways we relate to one another. Help parents to discipline, teach and cherish their children in godly ways so that they will grow in their knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus. We especially pray for those we know who don't yet know Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. May we be faithful in prayer and take every opportunity to share the gospel with them in word and deed. Help us to resist the world, the flesh and the devil as they distract us from you, Lord. May we truly seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, diligently reading and applying your word and trusting you in every circumstance of our lives. Father, we pray that you would refresh Jeff and Anne and Robin and Kathy and their families as they serve you in this church. And may you raise up the youth coordinator that you've chosen to work with us soon. Finally, we ask that you will bless the building of the Compassion Centre so that it will be a place of fruitful outreach to many people in our community. We pray all of these things in the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Ephesians reminds us that we are to speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, to sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we live in unusual times where we've been told that we're not allowed to sing to protect the safety of one another. It's this COVID times and that still is ongoing, as you know. And we do continue to pray for an end to COVID-19. But as we meet together, we do want to continue to hear the, hear the words of the songs and the lyrics and the music so that we can make music in our heart to God together. So I invite you to stand as we hear the following song. Our band will lead us. Uh, our job is to listen to the music, to make music in our hearts, but not to sing out loud. These guys will do that for us. So let's stand as we do this now as, a, as an opportunity for worship and encouragement. Weak made strong. 
Thank you so much, guys. We're going to continue by reading the Bible. And Betty and then David are going to read for us. If you brought your own Bibles, you might like to open it now to Ephesians. And Betty's going to lead us in that. Thanks, Betty. Paul writing into his letter to the Ephesians, beginning at chapter 2, verse 1. And as for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The second reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. Luke chapter 15. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Who's been to Uluru, formerly known as Ayers Rock? Almost everybody here. Well, if you have, you'll know that there is another amazing feature not very far away, for a long time known as the Olgas, and now by its uh, name, Katajuta. And it too is huge, an imposing monolith that just rises out of the desert. But you know what? As big as it is, it's possible to lose perspective, to lose a sense of its actual size. So as you're travelling from, um, say, Uluru to Katajuta, it's the view of Katajuta starts as a bit of a wobble in the heat haze. And then you get about 15 k's out and you think, oh my goodness, this is really big. And then you keep on speeding up till you get there and all of a sudden you're right up close and you walk inside it. You enter into it. And you're walking through this bright red cathedral. It takes up your whole field of vision. So, as it towers over and around you, you can stop looking at it as a feature and it just becomes a lot of red rock. Um, you can lose your sense of grandeur and the shape. And our kids were similar. They were awestruck when, when we were driving up to it and then they started to run in. And then after a while they stopped looking up. It was just another trail to them to run through like a maze. Um, and we just found them at the other end. Uh, they had not realised or appreciated that they were in this extraordinary cathedral, this amazing castle for a little while. And as much as Katajuda is a wonder to walk through, you need to see it from well set back as the light changes, as the sun goes down and the shadows lengthen and the desert light creates new shapes and some surprises. And I want to say that's like God's grace. We can lose perspective of its grandeur and its power to, to, to change the landscape and offer us new surprises. We must not allow God's grace to become just a well-worn backdrop to the scenery of the Christian experience. Grace has got to keep on coming at us all the time. And grace is God's magic light. And it creates new shapes and colours in our lives, especially when shadows lengthen. That's when we see God do his best work of light in our lives. Well, we've been glimpsing grace the last three weeks. We've talked about Jonah and Naaman, and now it's the prodigal son. We've been observing light, uh, how the light of God's grace softens the harsh landscape of people's souls. And today, as we take the familiar trail of the prodigal son, we need to see those 
surprises and colours again. So firstly, here's a, here's a landscape of the characters. Firstly, you've got the father. He's obviously very disappointed. But is he weak to give his son his share of the farm? Or is it a strength to let his son leave? What would be more costly, to hold his son on the farm or to let his son squander their money? Um, it's a parable. So it's not meant to be parenting advice and uh, it's not meant to bear the weight of too much character analysis. But I'd like to think that this father knows that there's no point in trying to make his son a slave to the farm as a hired servant. Otherwise he'd no longer be a son but a servant. Then there is the son. He's restless, he's reckless and he's impetuous. He has a very distorted view of the size of his life. He can't see the largeness of his life with the father. He thinks it's very small and that only the world can enlarge it. Maybe we see ourselves at that age or maybe even our kids now. Um, maybe not as full-blown prodigals, but kids who are in a hurry to taste everything that the world has on offer and to be independent. And then there is the brother, the elder brother. Now, he's not here in the story yet, but he's around. Uh, he's watching. At least he hears about the what the other son did later that night. Now, this son is faithful to the father. He's dependable. He's the model son. But in fact, he's severely broken. He harbours a bitterness that has just been waiting for the right conditions for it to spring up like fireweed. So there are our three characters. Incidentally, um, what do we think prodigal means? Do we think it means wicked? Or run away? Doesn't. And I love this. Prodigal means, now this is the di dictionary definitions, one, spending money or using resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant, so you can see the sun in that, or two, having or giving something on a lavish scale. The desert was prodigal, sorry, the dessert was prodigal with whipped cream. Got deserts on my mind. Does that surprise you? That's what prodigal means? It's delightful, isn't it? The son is prodigal in his waist, but the father, he's the real prodigal in this story. He lavishes with grace and forgiveness, even throws a party. Let's change our perception of what prodigal means. So the son goes and he wastes the father's money, binging, partying, prostitutes, and all that blood, sweat and tears to build the family farm, to build that economy base, half of it's gone now, wasted in, in instant gratification. And now the son can't even buy a friend or find a place to stay now that the, um, that the famine has struck. So he gets a job feeding pigs. Notice he's not shepherding sheep. They're not the scent of lanolin. He's not leading the sheep and calling them by name and them following. He's feeding dirty, foraging pigs. They are leading him through the muck. They eat and live better than him. He has become lower than the pigs. That's the graphic of this story. Most times the Bible is looking for that shepherd analogy and this is a pig analogy. But after a while, and through that hunger, and through those lengthening shadows, he remembers how large his life with the Father actually was. He comes to his senses, verse 17. And your translation might have the alternative that says, he came to himself. Isn't that nice? He came to himself. This awakening this moment of grace when light burst through darkness, when light dances on the soul and the most amazing revelation happens. God is revealed. The gracious Father. It often happens when shadows lengthen at sunset. 
And in this moment, he sees with a new insight. He says, the hired servants are better off. They live better on my father's estate than this. What if I just became one of them? It would be better to be a servant in my father's home than a free man in this world's economy, this vicious world, empty promise cycle. Little does he know, his father doesn't need another hired servant. Otherwise he would have made the son stay on the farm if he just wanted labour. What the father really wants is a son. But going through the son's head is, how can I make this move? How can I make my way back to the father and do this deal with him? How does the scoundrel move to become the servant? when he has his little moment he says i know i'll just set back to my father and say i've sinned against heaven and against you i'm no longer worthy to be called your son please take me on as one of your hired servants are you into this story Do you love this story are you part of this story Do you find yourself in this story never let it become so familiar that you don't see this story as an amazing cathedral, God's magic castle. We're all in this story. But this son, he has his little plan, and the problem was the son, his plans were never too big. You know, going to see the world and all those sort of things, they were never big plans, they were just small, too small. And even this plan of of going back to the father to be a servant, it's too small. But he heads home. Home. That word is one of the most powerful words in in any language. It resonates for us. He heads home. Maybe we talk about salvation with people too often when we really should be talking about home. Tim Keller suggests we should invite people to come home, home to where they really belong, home to where they have a father, home to where they've wandered from, a father who is prodigal, who lavishes us with love and meaning and hope. Home. But the sun heads home. But in the smallness of his expectations, he thinks it's all about a job prospect. Hide servant. Shame on that son. Doesn't he know the father after all these years? Has he forgotten what the father is really like? Or is he in too much of a hurry to get out that he never really understood the father? Well, he knows the way home and he's just about to meet the father he never knew. The waiting father, the gracious father, the prodigal father. So the father's waiting and he's been waiting probably in that same spot every afternoon since the son left, scanning the horizon, looking for his son. And then he sees this little wobble in the heat haze and he recognises that shape, even in that fierce son. He recognises that this is his son and what does he do? He runs. This respected elder lifts up his skirt and he runs. What a spectacle. Should have more dignity. No, he runs. You know, if we were directing this movie, we might just put a different spin on this. Maybe this is is a long trudge toward the father, head hung low. And maybe there's a silence and the father just gestures with his hand, for this son to come and grovel. The father runs. He runs to him. Um, this is a great pick. Now, I don't know, Robin, if you've ever given your children T-shirts that say, my dad ran. Apparently in America it's a thing. And uh, I, I reckon this day the prodigal son gets a T-shirt. My dad ran. In fact, I have preached on this previously. Oh, I won't put it on. 
my dad ran. Luke 15. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Well, the son tries to get his speech out. The part about I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, just treat me like a hired servant. And the father's probably still thinking if I wanted that servant, I would have forced you to stay. No, you are my son and today you have come home. You were lost and now you're found. And the, the father is prodigal with grace and forgiveness and a party. Now, this is the third story in this little set. I don't mean the name and Jonah, prodigal. I mean Luke 15, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Jesus has, has, has let this little story of lost things evolve. Coins, sheep, a son, a son or a daughter, a human experience. He wants every son and daughter to identify personally with this, this story because this is a story that resonates. Jesus wants every son and daughter to know that God is a father, not just a judge. But here's where the son did have it right, so right. He began by saying he was no longer worthy to be called a son. He had squandered the father's love much more than he'd squandered the father's money. He betrayed the father. And so the son was right to come to his senses and confess his sin. Yet as right as that response was, the father had already moved first. He was running before the son was speaking. It was the perfect reconciliation. And only God reconciles like that. He demands that we come to our senses, that we confess our sins to him, that we repent. But he's already made the first move by sending Jesus. Let me say this plainly. Every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve, every human being on this planet, on this earth, has rebelled and betrayed the living God, the Father, and needs to come home. To begin with, I'm no longer worthy, only to hear the sound of heaven's party drown out those words. God ran. Jesus exchanging his life for ours at the cross was God running to us. Everybody in this room needs this T-shirt. My father ran. Perhaps someone even in this room today or someone watching in their own home needs this T-shirt, needs to come home to the father who is waiting. You need this grace story now. You need to live in this amazing cathedral of drama. You need to live in this magic castle of God's. Well, of course, there is a postscript. This older brother. The brother is weary and he's coming home from his diligent work in the fields, his faithful work in the fields, and he hears the party and he asks the hired servant, what's going on? And the hired servant explains that this, this brother of yours has come home. Even though I think the hired servant must wonder about the father's love, what it's like to know a father's love like these two boys have. But the son sulks. The brother sulks. He's angry. The father comes out and says, look, he was dead and now he's alive. You've got to feel the grace. You've got to feel the love for your own brother. And what does the brother do? He sulks and he's angry. We saw a sulker most recently, didn't we, in, in uh, our stories? Yeah, the story of Jonah. Jonah was a sulker. And in Naaman, Gehazi was the sulker. The brother says, I'm the faithful one. I'm the one who didn't run off. Where's my party? 
I deserve more. You owe me more. You should punish that, that, that son for wasting half of everything. Why are you being so wasteful, Father? Why are you being so prodigal? You know, he doesn't want the father. He wants the father's stuff. He's just more polite about waiting. Why is there someone who, who never gets grace? And sometimes it's someone from God's own people who, who resents, who can't celebrate, who refuses to allow grace to flow. Why is there always someone who misses grace? How can a Christian refuse to be a generous giver? How can a Christian settle for being a fortunate receiver and a hoarder of all the good things that God has given us? Verse 32, the father only has these words to try and help the older brother come to himself. He says, this is your brother who is dead and is now alive was lost and is now found. So we're at the end of our little grace series and we're at the end of this story of grace. So as we stand in this postscript, who are you? Are you a son or a daughter who needs to come home? Will you come to your sense today? And meet the father who has already run. Are you the older brother who has been with the father all this time but stands outside the party, doesn't get it, needs to forgive someone, to reconcile with someone, needs to give and be generous to allow grace to flow? Come into the party. The party is called the church. God's showcase of grace to the world. Are you someone who just needed a little reminder today that we've been saved by grace through faith? A gift from God, nothing we've worked at so that none of us may boast. Maybe a gentle reminder of what it means to be part of this showcase of grace, giving and forgiving in a culture stripped of grace. Our Father, we thank you for this, this amazing story and we thank you that you are that amazing Father and indeed you ran before we even understood who we were. And we pray, Father, that you would change us daily by grace to be givers, to be gracious givers and forgivers. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jeff, for um, this reminder of God's grace for us. And what a wonderful story. Is it a special and important story for you? I've always really enjoyed every sermon I've heard from this part of the Bible. It's um, just so nice to be able to remember that our God is a heavenly Father who is gracious to us and always has his arms open to us. Uh, but friends, we're going to share in communion now. Communion is an opportunity for us uh, who are Christians to remember God's grace to us, shown to us, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a Christian, I'd like to encourage you to join with us in this. A Christian is someone who has repented of their sin, has turned um, to Christ by faith and has received forgiveness from him. It's also something that we do together when we are in good fellowship with our brothers and sisters, a symbol of our unity together as Christians together. Uh, friends, Jesus reminded us that as God's people, as people of the Heavenly Father, we are to love God and we are to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and we're also called to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. That's a really big calling on us as, um, as God's people and uh, frankly our world would be, um, would be better if we lived up to this call that God has on us. 
but we don't always do this as we should. And so what I want to do now is just to give you a moment before we share in communion together, simply to bring your life before God. So I'd like to encourage you to do that now, and after that we will pray together. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way, for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the good news is that if you turn to Jesus, then God, as he says to us in Ephesians chapter 1, that's what he does for us. He redeems you by his blood, and that means the forgiveness of your sins, all in complete accordance with the riches of his grace, God's prodigal grace. So now come, if you are a Christian, join with us. I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 23. Here is what we read. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that is, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So now, friends, I'd like to invite you to take the bread out of the packets that you've got there and take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. And now with this juice, drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Every time we share that, I'm reminded of just how costly it was for God to redeem us. The blood of Christ, the body of Christ, broken for us, that we might be forgiven, that we might live, that we might be able to come home. Friends, let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, friends, that does bring us to the end of our time together this morning. And thank you to everyone who's joined us online today. For those of you who are here in the building, I'd like to encourage you just to stick around outside and continue to share in some fellowship um, on the lawns outside. Just one announcement from me, and it is simply a reminder to you all to please remember to RSVP um, for our services when we gather together. We continue to have to monitor numbers and so that we can work out our spacing and what kind of buildings that we can use for our different services. So it's really helpful if you let us know which services you are coming to and when you are coming to them. And if you're not coming, it's also really helpful as well. 
So there should be um, on your emails, there should a survey should have been emailed out to you this week. So please respond to that. And if you're having trouble with that at all, just, just let me know and I can give you a hand with that. And, and the office as well will also be able to support you in that. Uh, it's just one of these uh, things that we do together so that we can continue to meet safely um, during this un unusual time that we're experiencing. Well, I hope that you've been able to um, worship God well today. I hope you've been able to remember God's grace to you, the, the one who is your Heavenly Father who welcomes you home. Let's pray as we finish this time together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you for the Lord Jesus we thank you for the grace you have shown to us, your prodigal grace. Father, we pray that you would keep us safe. We pray that you might sustain us as we live as your people in your world this week. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.